Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper analysis. Today we are going to cover the Hindu newspaper dated 1st of December 2019. The articles which we are going to cover today are displayed on the screen. So let's begin with the discussion. This article is published on page number 14, Fractured Verdicts and the Role of Governor. This article analyzes the discretion of the governor to appoint the chief minister and the council of minister under the constitution of India. This shall directly become relevant under the syllabus of GS2 mains under Indian constitution features as well as functions and responsibilities of the union and the state, issues and challenges pertaining to federal structure. In this discussion, we shall first understand the various constitutional provisions which are extremely important from point of view of prelims as well as means. And then we shall analyze what are the recommendations of the various commissions for interstate relations as well as Supreme Court judgments. Let's start the discussion. Now under the constitution of India, it's important to know that which part deals with the executive of the state and it is part 6. Now under part 6, the first chapter in general deals with the definition and chapter 2 which is the executive, the first part of this chapter deals with the governor which is from article 153 to 162. If you are asked about which of the following parts deals with the arrangement of state executive, so the answer is part 6. And similarly, Article 163 onwards deals with the arrangement of Council of Ministers. Now two articles are extremely important as far as the discussion is concerned. The first article is Article 163 which deals with Council of Ministers to aid and advise Governor and Article 64 which deals with the appointment of Chief Minister via Governor. Now under Article 163, there shall be a Council of Ministers with the chief minister at the head to aid and advise the governor. So article 163.1 mandates that there shall be a council of minister headed by a chief minister always to aid and advise the governor. That means the functions of the governor shall be carried out after the advice of chief minister and the council of ministers. But there is an exception except in so far as he is by or under this constitution required to exercise his functions or any of them in his discretion. So this exception is about that this constitution has given certain discretionary powers to the governor and as far as the exercise of those discretionary powers are concerned, the governor shall not pay heed to the advice of chief minister. So for example, if there is a bill which is being passed by the state legislature and the governor in his mind thinks that this bill violates certain principles of federal structure of the country or the constitution, then governor has the right to reserve that bill even if the chief minister or the council of ministers advise against them. And also article 163.2 specifies that if any question arises whether any matter is or is not a matter as respects which the governor is by or under this constitution required to act in his discretion, the decision of the governor in his discretion shall be final and the validity of anything done by the governor shall not be called in question on the ground that he ought or ought not to have acted in his discretion. So article 163.1 says that governor shall act on aid and advice of chief minister except when he is required to act in his or her discretion. And what are those scenarios or what are those situations under which the governor can act on discretion is totally left to be decided by the governor itself and it cannot be challenged or called into the question. So these are extremely wide powers which have been given to the governor. It's extremely relevant to note here that no such power has been given to the president of India but that is a matter of another discussion. These wide discretionary powers create a lot of troubles as far as federal structure of the country is concerned because 
there are a lot of instances where the party which is ruling the central government is different from the one which is governing the state and hence these wide powers given to the governor are exploited by the central government to mold the state legislatures or the functioning of the state government now it's also important to have a look at article 164 as it deals with the appointment of chief minister which is a case in point article 164 1 states that the chief minister shall be appointed by the governor and the other minister shall be appointed by the governor on the advice of the chief minister and the minister shall hold the office during the pleasure of the governor so it is very simple to understand that all the chief minister in the country are appointed by the governor but this article does not specifies who will be the chief minister or who shall be appointed by the governor to become the chief minister and this article is the reason that there is a debate over the power of the governor to appoint the chief minister as no criteria has been mentioned but we also know that there is an article 1642 which states that the council of ministers shall be collectively responsible to the legislative assembly of the state which essentially establishes the parliamentary system of government even at the state level as far as appointment is concerned governor has the power to appoint anyone as chief minister but there is a condition that the council of minister headed by the chief minister should command majority in the state legislature so in accordance with the conventions of the parliamentary system of government the governor has to appoint the leader of the majority party in the state legislative assembly as the chief minister as far as a single party obtains a majority after a legislative elections there is no trouble and there is no doubt straight away governor appoints the chief minister but the trouble emerges when no party or no single coalition is successful in attaining the majority recent elections of maharashtra reflect the same situation let's now analyze the past instances as well now starting with 2017 if you recall we had goa and manipur legislative assembly elections in which the largest party was not invited to form the government by the governor similarly in 2018 we have meghalaya and karnataka election results again where in the swearing in of chief minister of karnataka was conducted even though that person did not command the majority and now recently in 2019 the maharashtra assembly election results now there was a prolonged stalemate in maharashtra over the formation of a government as no single party commanded a majority of its own after the assembly elections although it was not a totally fractured verdict a pre poll alliance of bjp and shiv sena had a clear majority they commanded 161 mlas out of total 288 elected as we know that this alliance broke later on so even as a post poll combination was being worked out maharashtra governor gave out a controversial decision to administer the oath to devendra fadnavis of bjp as a chief minister and ajit pawar of ncp as a deputy chief minister now this decision of the governor was challenged in supreme court of india and which ordered an early floor test now as we know that a new post poll combination has been worked out between ncp shiv sena and the congress along with some independents and they have formed the government now these developments in maharashtra have again brought the focus on the discretionary power of the governor as far as appointment of council of ministers headed by chief minister is concerned all this could happen because constitution is silent on who governor should invite to form the government under article 1641 it is extremely pertinent to discuss the recommendation of two important commissions for center state relations which are sarkaria and punchi commissions as well as two important supreme court judgments which are sr bombay case and rameshwar prasad case we'll start with discussing the common points of sarkaria and punchi commission reports these two commissions have laid down guidelines in such scenarios where no single party or coalition is able to attain the majority after election results so they have given a sequential order to be followed by the governor in such situations if post election results no party 
or combination of parties are able to achieve majority governor should ideally invite the parties or the combination of parties with widest support if this also does not works then governor should ideally invite pre poll alliance or coalition which has the widest support after failing these two the governor should invite group of parties which had pre poll alliance and the largest number followed by this governor should invite single largest party in the legislature followed by post electoral alliance so these are the clearly laid down sequential order under sarkaria and punchi commission now under sr bombay case which is the most important case as far as center state relations is concerned the judgment emphasized on the floor test within 48 hours the key principle that ought to guide the governor's discretion has been laid out the proper course for testing the strength of ministry is floor test that alone is the constitutionally ordained forum even though this verdict was in context of imposition of president's rule in different states the principle holds good for any situation in which governors have to decide on the appointment of a chief minister or continuance of a regime based on its numerical strength in the house which basically means that although sr bombay case gave the floor test to decide the continuance of a state government before the imposition of president rule or dissolution of the legislature but that supreme court judgment is still applicable in all those situations in which the governor has to decide which government should be formed or should be carried on in rameshwar prasad case of 2005 the court ruled that there was nothing wrong in installing a post poll combination and that the governor could not decline the formation of a government on the ground that it was being done through unethical means so these are the two extremely relevant court judgments as far as the discretionary power of the governor is concerned so the constitutional provisions under article 163 and 164 become extremely relevant and you should always keep in mind these two provisions under part 6 of the constitution of india as far as the mains examination is concerned the issue of discretionary powers of governor whether in appointment or the imposition of president rule or the reservation of the bills are extremely relevant and hence it's important to quote instances of doubtful usage by the governor in the answer then it's also extremely important to mention the constitutional provisions then as far as the ideal path which the governor should take or the way forward should be taken from sarkaria and punchi commissions which were reinstated in rameshwar prasad case it's also very important to keep in mind sr bombay judgment while writing answers under gs2 mains paper moving on to the next article on page number 1 north east to be shielded from citizenship law impact now new citizens which are to be rewarded with the indian citizenship shall not be allowed to settle in the northeastern region this has been stated by our home minister mr amit shah now this particular news deals with the provisions of citizenship amendment bill 2019 which amends citizenship act 1955 union home minister amit shah has assured civil society and political representative from the northeastern states that tribal areas in assam meghalaya and tripura and states protected by inner line permit system which are arunachal pradesh mizoram and nagaland would be shielded from the impact of this new act now this exemption will mean that all those illegal or undocumented non muslims from bangladesh pakistan and afghanistan who acquired indian citizenship under the new law will not be allowed to settle in these areas and states but can do so in other parts of the country it's important for us from the perspective of prelims examination to understand the provisions of citizenships and to analyze the bill as far as the syllabus of gs2 and gs3 is concerned let's now first understand the constitutional and legal provisions for citizenship now as far as the constitutional provisions are concerned the part 2 of the constitution of india deals with the citizenship and article 5 6 7 8 9 10 and 11 deals with various provisions related to citizenship now it is important to note that from article 5 to article 9 deal with the provisions of citizenship at the time of the commencement of the constitution is concerned article 10 deals with the continuance of the rights of citizenship 
an article 11 which is the most important article of this part deals with the power of the parliament to regulate the right of citizenship by law which means that constitution has given the power to enact legislations regarding the provisions of awarding or taking away citizenships to various persons but only after enactment of a law and this power has been given under list 1 item number 17 which is citizenship naturalization and aliens there are two takeaways from these constitutional provision number one only parliament has the power to regulate the citizenship and it is given such a right under part two of the constitution of india item 17 under list one which is union list under seventh schedule deals with such a power let's now move on and analyze the citizenship amendment bill 2019 now the current status of the bill is that the bill was passed by the Lok Sabha but lapsed as it could not be passed in the Rajya Sabha. Now the Citizenship Amendment Bill 2019 amends the Citizenship Act 1955 which is the only act dealing with providing or taking away citizenship for various peoples. Now there are two important provisions of this new bill which needs consideration. Now the first is grant of citizenship. And the second is the condition through which the citizenship shall be granted. Now as far as the first provision is concerned, this bill provides for Indian citizenship to all persecuted religious minorities from three neighboring countries, Pakistan, Afghanistan and Bangladesh and the religious communities who are eligible for the grant of citizenship are Hindus, Parsis, Jains, Christians and Buddhists. Now this deals with all those people who entered into the territory of India illegally or you can say the undocumented refugees or migrants into the territory of India before 31st December 2014 which basically means that all those people who have entered into the territory of India before 31st December 2014 from these three countries and belonging to either of these five religions would be eligible for grant of citizenship of India and that citizenship will be provided under the clause of naturalization. Now naturalization is the legal act or process by which a non-citizens of a country may acquire citizenship or nationality of that country. So all these undocumented migrants obviously were either Bangladeshis or Pakistanis or Afghanis as they entered into India for various reasons obviously they would not automatically qualify for Indian citizenship and hence they would have to go through the process of naturalization. Now under current Citizenship Act 1955, the period for which the migrants will have to stay in the country continuously is 11 years. But for these people belonging to these countries, this requirement has been reduced to only 6 years. So if a person has entered into the country and has continuously stayed here for 6 years will not be eligible for citizenship. Now these amendments have raised a lot of questions as well as appreciation. Let's now first look at the benefits which various communities shall derive from this particular amendment. Now the first and foremost benefit of this amendment is that it provides citizenship to persecuted minorities from the neighboring countries. We know that in Pakistan and Afghanistan as well as in Bangladesh, Hindus and Buddhists have been under persecution for some time and hence it will be a big relief for these communities migrating to India to save themselves. Now the second benefit is that this will enable Chakmas who are traditionally Buddhists and Hajongs who are Hindus to attain Indian citizenship who are currently staying in Arunachal Pradesh. Now these Chakma and Hajong refugees originally were the residents of Chittagong hill tracts of former East Pakistan and they had to flee when their land was submerged by a dam project in 1960s. Also there were instances of religious persecution. The groups entered India through Mizoram and settled there but later on government of India resettled them in Arunachal Pradesh. These are the two very obvious benefits arising out of Citizenship Amendment Bill 2019. But there are a lot of concerns as well. So now let's look at the demerits. Now on the face of it, this Citizenship Amendment Bill might be termed as a violation of Article 14 as it 
discriminates people on the basis of religion as we know that article 14 establishes equality before law that the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of laws within the territory of india which basically means it prohibits the discrimination on grounds of religion race caste sex or place of birth and since we know under the five religions which have been mentioned muslims have not been included and hence it could be termed as a violation of article 14 now another issue is that rational behind the selection of these three countries and the religion is not clear for example myanmar is also our neighboring country and the rohingya crisis going on in myanmar clearly demonstrates that muslims are also persecuted in myanmar but under this citizenship amendment bill there is no place to provide them with the citizenship so clearly citizenship amendment bill 2019 fails to provide citizenship to all the religious persecuted minorities in our neighborhood now the third demerit is that after the enactment of this bill there shall be a threat to local demographics now this issue has been raised in the article today where the representatives from the northeast states have met home minister to assuage these doubts so for example if the people who acquire citizenship as per this bill want to go to either arunachal pradesh or meghalaya and settle there so obviously this is a big threat to northeastern region of our country and we know we have enacted various provisions in the constitutions as well as in legislations to ensure that the demographics of northeastern region does not changes against their own wishes so that's why mr amit shah has assured the representatives from northeast that although the citizenship shall be provided to the migrants belonging to these three countries but they shall not be allowed to settle in the northeastern region so as currently people belonging to the rest of the states need inner line permit to go to meghalaya or arunachal pradesh similarly the new citizens will also need the same kind of permits to enter those areas they can have indian citizenship but cannot settle in these states they will still require the consent of the state government which basically means that these migrants can become citizens in bengal or delhi but not the residents of these states for the purpose of voting business or doing jobs the bill shall contain provisions to safeguard the demographics of northeastern region so the states of northeast are opposing this bill amid the concerns that outsiders would settle there and that their unique tradition and culture would be compromised and we need to make sure that these concerns regarding various sections of indian population are addressed and we need our parliamentarians to raise these issues while the debate over this particular bill is going on in the parliament it is important to mention here that the criteria chosen for providing citizenship should not be complicated and should not be contradictory and should not create doubts in the minds of the sections of society and only then a nation can prosper to its full capacity let's now move on to the next news the next article is published on page number 16 firefighters under fire for fighting amazon blaze four volunteers who were fighting the amazon fires were arrested on charges of starting fires now this article becomes important in the perspective of the ongoing amazon forest fires since past few months under the upsc syllabus of general studies 3 we have conservation environmental pollution and degradation environmental impact assessment as well as disaster and disaster management so we'll first start by analyzing the locations of amazon forest fires then we will look into the causes of these events of forest fires especially the ones which have increased in past one year then we will also look into the impacts which these fires are creating and then we will analyze some of the measures which need to be taken in order to solve this problem so there is nothing valuable in this article as far as upsc syllabus is concerned but we will use this opportunity to analyze the amazon forest fires as a whole so starting with the location and characteristics of amazon rainforest as you can see that this is a map of south america on which equator has been plotted the location of equator is somewhere around here so being equatorial region 
this area observes a lot of rainfall along with a constant high temperature throughout the year. So perennially high rainfall as well as high temperature leads to the development of rainforest in this territory which we known as Amazon rainforest marked in the map with green color. Now this Amazon rainforest becomes important from the perspective of environment and biodiversity as it is the world's most primitive and pristine ecosystem as well as most biodiverse region of the world. The kind of genetic varieties, species varieties as well as ecosystem diversity found in this region is not observed anywhere else across the world. Apart from flora and fauna biodiversity, the Amazon rainforest also house one of the world's most primitive indigenous tribal groups in these forests with which we have not been able to establish contacts with. Such a dense vegetation also helps in production of a lot of oxygen and hence these rainforests are also known as lungs of the world. Now it is important to realize that Amazon rainforests are not limited only to Brazil but they are extended to Peru, Ecuador, Colombia as well as Venezuela. So, so there are five main countries which contain Amazon rainforests. Let's now analyze the causes behind Amazon rainforest fires. Now these forest fires can be caused by natural as well as anthropogenic factors. Natural factors might include lightning, landslide or dry weather. As we know that Amazon rainforest location is in southern hemisphere. So since past few months it is the beginning of summer season and this year has been typically very dry which have created appropriate situations for forest fires to spread. So one of the most important reasons in recent forest fires in Amazon rainforest has been typically dry air. Now there is another speculation behind these forest fires and that is anthropogenic. It has been reported that farmers living in the vicinity of these rainforests are deliberately putting fires in these forests. They not only want to create more lands for agriculture but they also want to extend the region under pasture lands. Animal husbandry becomes really easy if more and more land is available for grazing. And hence we can summarize that the two main causes for forest fires especially this year has been the dry weather and anthropogenic. Let's now analyze that why have forest fires in Amazon forest become such a big cause of global concern. Global community is concerned because of multi-dimensional impact which these Amazon rainforests are going to have across the world. Let's start with the contribution of these fires towards global warming and climate change. As we know that forests are great carbon sink. They help in the reduction of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere through the process of photosynthesis. In this process they also produce oxygen for us. If we constantly keep on removing the forests and that to the world's most densely forested areas then we are significantly reducing the capacity of the earth to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. This will severely dent our efforts towards climate change mitigation. Also the burning of these forest fires are directly contributing to the carbon addition into the atmosphere which is accelerating the global warming then these will also induce changes into hydrological cycle. As we know forests are not only the result of rainfall but they also aid in inducing rainfalls. Then third most important impact of forest fires would be on biodiversity. As we know that these are the world's most biodiverse regions and hence burning these forests would reduce the biodiversity of this area in particular and overall earth in general to a great extent. And these forests if not stopped have the potential to convert these equatorial rainforests into savanna grasslands. And the third direct impact of forest fires is on tribals. As we know that most primitive and isolated tribal population lives in Amazon rainforests and hence the forest fire is not only choking their small villages inside deep forests but also reducing the livelihood options for them. Let's now understand the mitigation measures which need to be taken in order to avoid these kinds of situations. As we know that this is such an important issue that the action needs to be taken at two levels. 
first is at the national levels in the countries where the forest has spread and the second is international action now as far as international community is concerned we can come up with a consensus to create some protocol like kyoto protocol or paris agreement in order to put pressure on these governments to mitigate the forest fires and this protocol can create punitive measures as well as supportive measures now as far as punitive measures are concerned they can deal with they can deal with rebuking the national governments as well as cutting down funds to them or stopping trade with them but as far as supportive measures are concerned we can give financial aid collected throughout the world to these 5 to 6 countries in order to take care of their rainforests also as these countries are extremely dependent upon raw material and forests for their livelihoods and revenues we can help with funds so that they don't have to exploit these rainforests let's now consider the national governments through which the real action will happen so the first and the foremost step is the active dousing of these fires so the national governments of these countries need to create a big workforce of firefighters who can reach the deep forest regions either through air water or through land and douse them immediately for this they will not only need manpower but also the technological advancements now these technological advancements like satellite imagery remote sensing will enable the immediate identification of new fires emerging from deep areas the third step and which is the most crucial step which the brazilian government needs to take is the diversification of its economy as we know that brazil and all these countries are extremely dependent upon natural resources or primary sources of economic production for their revenues and we know that the primary sources of production need a lot of land area to be effective for example if a country derives its major part of income from agricultural sources then obviously a lot of land is required for cultivation but on the other hand if a country derives its major part of income or revenues from secondary or tertiary sources of economy then obviously it does not need as much land and hence it's important for brazil and other governments of this region to diversify their economy into secondary and tertiary sectors and the developed countries of the world along with india and china should help the brazil in this diversification it is extremely important not only for these regions but for the global community to effectively resolve this problem of amazon forest fires otherwise already delayed targets of paris climate deal will be delayed further due to these forest fires let's now move on to the next news moving on to the next news which is on page number 8 pslv gearing up for its 50th flight so indian space research organization isro is preparing for the 50th flight of polar satellite launch vehicle or in short pslv popularly known as agency's workhorse which means that it has been the most successful launch vehicle or the rocket which has been developed by the isro now the launch vehicle is an agent which takes the main payload or the satellites or whatever it may be to the space now so far 49 pslv missions have lifted off from satish dhawan space center shri harikota there are a lot of achievements for which pslv is known we shall look into them but before it's important to look at the relevance of this news straight away in mains examination under gs3 section achievements of indians in science and technology indigenization of technology and developing new technology the third line reads awareness in the fields of it space apart from that successive years upsc has asked questions regarding the configuration of the satellites or the rockets as well as about various space missions this is a question asked in 2018 prelims examination with reference to the irnss consider the following statements irnss has three satellites in geostationary and four satellites in geosynchronous orbits irnss covers entire india and about 5500 square kilometer beyond its borders india will have its own satellite navigation system with full global coverage by middle of 2019 so you can see that to what extent upsc has gone into details to ask the question on irnss and it was pslv which launched irnss into space then in 2019 the question number 6 of gs3 question paper asked about what is india's plan to have its own space station 
and how will it benefit our space program this question has also been discussed in our series of videos discussing 2019 mains questions so you can go and have a look at those as well so we will start by first understanding what the PSLV is what are its various components and since PSLV is basically used to launch low earth orbit satellites we will also have a look at polar orbits and sun synchronous orbit now PSLV is not the first generation but the third generation launch vehicle developed by India it is the first Indian launch vehicle to be equipped with liquid stages which means that the fuel which it uses also have liquid components to it and it is first such vehicle developed by India now the first successful launch of PSLV was carried out in 1994 since then PSLV has emerged as the reliable and versatile workhorse launch vehicle of India with 39 consecutively successful missions by June 2017 which means that in 39 missions continuously it has not failed but it has achieved the target for which it was meant. Coming to the components of PSLV. PSLV has four stages which use both solid and liquid fuels. Now whenever we use the term stages what do we mean by it? We have a representational image of a PSLV rocket and you can see that whenever you have a look at the rocket it is arranged vertically into stages. So this is stage 1, this is stage 2, this is stage 3 and this is stage 4. Apart from these stages it also has strap on motors which are if you see in the image small small rockets 4 or 8 in numbers arranged just beside the base of the rocket which immediately give the thrust and then burn off. But these are the four main stages. So the first and third stage of PSLV use solid fuel while the second and fourth stage use liquid fuels. So PSLV is first such rocket created by India which contains both solid as well as liquid fuels. Now as far as the utility is concerned it is designed to deliver earth observation or remote sensing satellites. Earth observation is the gathering of information about the physical, chemical and biological systems of the planet via remote sensing technologies which can also be supplemented by surveying techniques such as collection and on ground analysis of the data. While remote sensing is gathering of information about an object or phenomena without making physical contact with the object and thus in contrast to on-site observation especially the earth. So remote sensing is extensively used in geological surveys, geographical surveys, study of hydrology of a region or glaciology or understanding the minerals found in an area. It also has military and intelligence applications. Coming to the payload which the PSLV can carry, it is about 1700 kg to sun synchronous polar orbits of 600 to 900 km altitudes. So these are very low earth orbits. These are just limited to less than 1000 kilometers from the surface of the earth and hence it is not as powerful as GSLV which has the capacity to carry objects to 36,000 kilometers of altitude. But it can also carry smaller payloads to elliptical geosynchronous orbit. This is not to be confused with the proper geosynchronous orbit which is around circular but this is the elliptical geosynchronous orbit which has minor axis of less than 1000 kilometers. So if this is the earth then this is elliptical geosynchronous orbit with this length less than 1000 kilometers. Since earlier we did not have GSLV so we utilize the PSLV to launch a satellite into this orbit and as soon as the satellite reached this point we fired its remaining motor to extend this minor axis to full geosynchronous orbit to make it a completely circular orbit. Now as far as the achievements of PSLV is concerned, apart from launching all the satellites safely into space of IRNSS system, it has also launched Chandrayaan-1 to moon as well as Mars orbiter space craft in 2013 to Mars. Now moving on to polar orbit and sun synchronous orbit. Now a polar orbit usually has an inclination of 90 degrees to the equator which means that if this is the earth and this is the equator then polar orbit 
is 90 degree to the equator. The satellites are located at much lower altitude of less than 1000 kilometers and contrast this to geostationary orbits where the satellites are located at an altitude of around 36,000 kilometers from the Earth's surface. However, in case of polar orbit, the satellites are located at much lower altitude. Hence, due to their lower altitude, the orbital speed of the polar satellites is much higher than that of geostationary satellites. The satellites in polar orbit can pass over the north and south pole several times a day. So, this is the north pole and this is the south pole. And satellite is continuously making rotations. But at the same time, the earth is also rotating beneath this orbit like this. Let's visualize the motion of satellite around the earth. The satellite has just carried out its first round above this surface. And the first round is represented with blue color. Now as we know that earth is continuously rotating, the next time when the satellite comes to the same plane, the region beneath this point has shifted and now it has a new strap of land. So if this satellite has a high resolution camera, then you can easily visualize that through multiple rounds, this satellite can carry out effective mapping of a region of a earth by continuous revolutions of the earth. And hence, these kinds of satellites are extremely useful for earth mapping, earth observation, capturing the earth as time passes, as well as reconnaissance satellites, which are basically used for intelligence and military purposes. Now there is a special case of polar satellite, which is sun synchronous orbit. It is orbit that combines altitude and inclination in such a way that the satellite passes over any given point of the planet surface at the same local solar time. This means that every day when the satellite passes over a point on earth, the position of the sun in relation to the satellite and the earth would be same. This is very useful thing to do for a weather or surveillance satellite. So this ensures that the photographs which are taken by the satellites or the data which is collected by the satellite is taken at the same time and hence it has almost the same sunlight available. So it becomes very easy to compare the photographs. Let's compare an example where let's say a country like India doubts that Pakistan is developing a nuclear power station very near to the bordering areas of the India and analyzing the data obtained from sun synchronous orbit which are basically the images taken at the same local time we can easily see the build up or the construction or the various kinds of activities going on at the same location and hence it becomes very effective tool for intelligence. India has mastered this art of polar satellite launch vehicle which it is not only using for our strategic as well as economic purposes but it is also commercially utilizing this for revenue generation and it is sending the satellites of private companies as well as from other nations into space by charging a fees. So you can see that the two important components of our, of our space program are GSLV and PSLV. GSLV has already been detailed in the past and now you can understand the various components of PSLV. The next news appears on page number 14 and it deals with the objection which have been raised with respect to transgender persons bill 2019. Now we are not going to cover this news as it was covered in DNS dated 27th of November 2019 which was 4 days ago. In that discussion as you can see on the screen that the relevant provisions of the bill was covered along with the issues and objections which have been raised by various stakeholders. Now we shall take up few questions for prelims examination. So the first question has been taken from a news which has been published on page number 19 which is antibiotic prescription rate high in private sector. A new study by Public Health Foundation of India has revealed the high rate of antibiotic prescription in India, especially in the private sector. The key highlights of the study are that antibiotic prescription rate is high in private sector at 412 per thousand persons in India. Per capita antibiotic consumption has increased by around 20% between 2012 and 2016. And highest antibiotic prescriptions are seen for respiratory illness, for example, tuberculosis. Now the question is, which of the following are the reasons for high antibiotic resistance in India? First, 
ओवर यूज ऑफ एंटीबायोटिक्स इन लाइफ स्टॉक फॉर प्रमोटिंग ग्रोथ बैड सैनिटेशन प्रैक्टिसेस इनकम्प्लीट एंटीबायोटिक डोसेज द करेक्ट आंसर इज डी दैट मीन्स ऑल थ्री ऑफ देम आर रिस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर एंटीबायोटिक रेजिस्टेंस इन इंडिया नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन इज विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग स्टेटमेंट आर करेक्ट अबाउट पी एस एल बी फर्स्ट इट कंटेन्स थ्री स्टेजेस विच इज क्लियरली रॉन्ग एज वी हैव सीन दैट इट हैज फोर स्टेजेस सेकेंड ऑप्शन इज इट हैज बोथ लिक्विड एंड सॉलिड स्टेजेस विच इज करेक्ट थर्ड ऑप्शन इज इट कैन नॉट लॉन्च सेटेलाइट इन टू पोलर ऑर्बिट विच इज एब्सोल्यूटली रॉन्ग एज वी हैव सीन दैट द मेन पर्पज फॉर विच पी एस एल वी हैज बीन क्रिएटेड इज टू लॉन्च लो ऑल्टीट्यूड पोलर ऑर्बिट्स एंड हेंस द करेक्ट आंसर इज सी टू ओनली मूविंग ऑन टू द लास्ट क्वेश्चन श्री हरिकोटा इज लोकेटेड इन विच ऑफ द फॉलोइंग स्टेट्स तमिलनाडु केरला आंध्र प्रदेश कर्नाटका एंड द करेक्ट आंसर इज आंध्र प्रदेश विद दिस वी कम टू द एंड ऑफ टूडेज डिस्कशन Let's have a look at the question of the day.